Welcome everyone to another afternoon, another session um, at Def Jam. I hope you had lunch and um, you're satisfied and happy and ready for a new session. So I'm Mary Beth Aquino and I will moderate you through um, the rest of the day here in this room. And now I will hand over to Al Yang from Big Point who will talk about the myth of innovation. Stage is yours. Yeah, thank you. So thanks everybody for coming down today and taking your afternoon. Uh, let me know if I'm talking a little bit too fast, sorry. I don't speak any German, so this will be in English, apologies. Um, so today we're gonna talk about the myth, of the myth of innovation, or the subtext here is what it's really about, which is preserving player expectations. This is one of these simple things that are often overlooked, but it's so, so important about your game. Um, a little bit about myself, my name is Al Yang, I'm the lead designer over at Big Point for Shards of War. Uh, many of you guys might have been down to our offices yesterday and taking a look around. The messiest desk in the office, that one was mine, so it was pretty easy to spot. Uh, previously, I was working at Sony at uh, Superbot doing uh, PlayStation All-Stars Battle Royale, uh, doing the main combat systems and characters over there. And then before that, I was working for quite a while in China with THQ making games for the online market there. So today, we're again, we're talking about the myth of innovation, talking about basically preserving the core, what is innovation about, and to basically help us along the way, we're gonna talk about Mercalite to Shards of War. This is the game we're working on right now. What we changed during here, and how come this was innovative? What did we do? How does this actually relate to innovation? Along the way, we're gonna talk about some other games that you may or may not know, but kinda help us all out. So, Mercalite, how many of you guys actually know Mercalite? Raise your hands. As there's one guy here who's actually worked on it, and sitting, sitting in the middle, I fall. So, what Mercury was is a military MOBA. Now, how many of you guys are familiar with MOBAs, kind of like League of Legends, Heroes of the Storm, Dota? A couple, a couple of you guys. Okay, so what a MOBA is these days is basically stands for Multiplayer Online Battle Arena. It's a fairly loose term, basically used if you have a group, a team fighting another team in kind of an arena setting online. There's the classic stuff, kind of like League of Legends, like Dota, and it's kind of branched out into some crazier stuff also. So, what we did is made a military mobile, top-down battlefield, that was the way it was supposed to be uh, sold. We had a tier system, something really cool, you see this a lot in games like World of Tanks, uh, basically World of Tanks style progression. It was a web and a client game, that was really cool, so you could play the game both online, also with a client. Very, very accessible game. And this is what it looked like. There you go, that was Merc Elite. Pretty cool looking game. A lot of really innovative stuff in there. So what happened? We went into open beta on October 2013, closed in August 2014, so it didn't, didn't last all that long in a live state. Technically a very innovative game. You saw from all the features we showed, it looked really cool. However, we had some fundamental design issues and we'll be talking about this very shortly. So, what went wrong? This is basically what we're gonna cover and then how this actually feeds into what type of innovation actually makes sense for your game. So, word on the street, I want you guys to focus on this today is expectations, all right? So this is very, very important. It's probably be the most important word you hear today. Probably one of the most important words in not just game design, but all product design, period. So, what does this basically mean? I like to say, I like to use a lot of food examples, so you have to bear with me. Uh, <laughs> I'm on a seafood diet. I see food, I eat it. Anybody? Okay, one guy, thanks. Thank you, thank you. Oh, you should have seen GDC, that was so quiet when I said that, it was terrible. So, cheeseburger conundrum. Well, what this is is straying too far from your comfort zone. And this is the same thing, because it's the same with food as it is with games. Everybody has a comfort level there. So, say for instance, you're a really big fan of cheeseburgers, 
You're like, all right, I'll eat any cheeseburger you put in front of me. So you can say this is maybe like an action game or like a brawling game. I'm like, hey, you want to try some sushi? It's also a good food. It's pretty delicious, but it's actually very, very far away from what you're used to. And there's a lot of the things you see with games. Um, the, even the worst part is if you give somebody something that looks like a burger, but it's actually like sushi or something else in disguise. That's a pretty rude awakening. Um, you guys know those chocolate things? It's like the thing I hate most. Like you get a box of chocolates and you don't know what's inside each of them and you just have to guess. It's the same kind of idea. It's like you don't want people to look at your game and be like, what, what's actually inside this thing? It looks like it's chocolate, but it's going to be coconut, and I hate coconut. That kind of idea. So, I mean, people eat stuff like this. If you like a burger, you look at this, you'd be like, oh, yeah, that's just a really big burger. Maybe I'm not hungry enough to eat that, but yeah, I'd eat that. But what I'm trying to say is maybe the form factor is a really big difference here. When people see something they're not really used to, you really want to kind of bring it into a package they understand. So. You can't go all the way right away. You can't go from burger to sushi, maybe a fish sandwich. At least the meat is the same, part of it is the same, but the presentation, the packaging is still there. So, expectations. How does this relate to other games? How many of you guys know this Resident Evil 5? Any of you guys play this? Resident Evil fans? Okay, a couple of you guys. So, for those of you who don't know, Resident Evil is a horror game. It's about scaring people. Now, when a lot of fans saw Resident Evil 5, they're like, what is this game? Suddenly, it's not scary, it's just an action game, you're shooting everything, there's co-op, it's like Gears of War with zombies, or with different zombies. Um, and that's the thing, is like, it's not necessarily a bad game, it actually won an award for best action game of the year from IGN, but there's the problem, is like, it's a horror game. People who are used to Resident Evil are like, hey, this is a horror game, what the heck is going on? And the people who wanted to play an action game are like, why would I play Resident Evil? It's a horror game. Expectations. Same thing for a game like this. This is Spore. How many of you guys played Spore? How many of you guys can accurately describe to me what Spore actually is? <laughs> I, think, I think that's basically it. It's like you expect something, it's well right, you come from The Sims, you expect a specific type of game, but what you get is very interesting. That's the kind of thing, is like you can't let your player's expectations down. It'll build up a lot of hype in the beginning, but once people get hands on, it really crumbles apart. On the other end, you can make some really, really strange stuff. Katamari Damacy, if you guys ever played this, it's a game about a little space dude who rolls stuff up into a ball, into a really even bigger ball, and then turns into a star. It's so random, but it did quite well because they didn't try to hide what it was. They're like, hey, look, we'll tell you exactly what you want. And you look at this, and people, some people go like, yeah, I don't like that game. I don't like the way it looks. I don't like the way it feels. I'm not even going to touch it. That's fine. You don't want these people playing your game anyway, but you want to make sure the people who would be interested know exactly what you're getting. Even weird games like this guy. If any of you guys ever played this guy, this is a really random game. It's like exploding penguins, and you're, like, you're stacking people on top of each other and throwing them, and just really, it's like you fight the Power Rangers, and then it's just, it's all over the place. But again, it's about finding your market, finding the people who want to play your game, and selling it to them, and making sure you're targeting those guys. Don't give them false expectations. That's a biggie. So, talk a little bit about expectations as it related to Merc Elite. What did we screw up there? So, platform. First thing is we went web. Web is pretty cool. You know, you can basically access it from anywhere. However, we built a mobile. When you looked at that game, that did not look like a casual game. That was not like a farm bill level kind of stuff. That was a game that was really meaty, a lot of fighting in there. And even then, with expectations, you're like, well, web games are casual. Why would I play a hardcore game in my browser? It's not a thing. You have to really push that angle. And that's the problem we had, which is players are like, well, it can't be that core of a game. It just runs in the web browser. And that's why we built the client later on. But by that time, it was too late. And this doesn't just relate to games like Merc Elite. There's Mega Man. On the iPhone, I don't think anyone thinks Mega Man is a bad game, but you put it on the wrong platform, you don't expect to play this type of game on that type of platform. Even really, really good games don't usually work out if they're on the wrong platform. I don't think anybody can tell me that StarCraft is a bad game, but I'm pretty sure you can tell me that StarCraft on the N64 was not the best idea for controls. So that's what we did. So when we went to launch Shards of War, we just went straight to client. That's what we did. We didn't want to basically confuse people into like even thinking. That's the thing. Is like they look at it and they're like, I think this may be a casual game. It, why would it be on the web? You don't even want to put that thought in people's heads. So first impression. First impression is really, really important. So based on that video you saw and basically the screenshot, what type of game does this look like just looking at this? Anybody? It's an action game? 
Yeah, twin stick shooter, tactical, yeah. If you just look at it, it looks like it's a twin stick shooter. It looks like this, this is alien swarm. Even the camera angle, everything looks pretty much the same. I'm gonna go back and forth like a really bad GIF. Pretty much looks the same. However, it controlled like this. You just click around all day and click to shoot people. Didn't feel like a twin stick shooter at all. And that's the thing about expectations is we put in a wrapper that people were like, ah, this is a twin stick shooter. It's a heavy duty action game wrapper. But when you actually played it, it was slow. Really, really, really slow. Much more tactical in that sense. It was more like a tactics game than anything else. And this is where we pushed it. We basically, when we switched to Shards of War, we did, we did exactly that. We were like, well, it looks like a twin stick shooter. People expect a twin stick shooter. So that's what we did, WASD shooting. Ammo and reload, this is a fun one. Actually, I have a story about this that I always tell, and the guy the story is about is actually sitting right in the room, so this is very cool. Um, one of the expectations you get from a shooter is there's ammo and reload, something you don't get from a MOBA right here, because in a shooter, it's like, hey, if I'm good, one headshot, you're out. I don't need a giant clip of ammo. That's the skill involved. In a MOBA, you're like, okay, I'm just gonna keep attacking you. Base attacks are usually pretty slow, especially for our game. Now, we had a mechanic in there, which is like, oh, it's a shooter, so players, and this is the opposite version of uh, expectations, we expect ammo and reload, because it's a, it's, we wanna make it a military thing, you wanna make it with guns, so it's gotta have that. So, that was a problem, because it would basically stop combat flow all the time. You'd be attacking someone, and then suddenly you're like, for no reason, you'd just be out of ammunition, you'd have to reload, it didn't do anything except slow the game down. So we did an experiment. We basically made the ammunition self-reload slowly for a while, told everybody. People were like, oh yeah, it feels a little bit better, but they're like, we're gonna take this out. Everyone's like, no, 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 because it's a shooter, you gotta have ammo and reload in there. So we didn't do anything, and we just took it out, and we made it like completely like unlimited ammo. Nobody on the team noticed, except one guy. Thank you, Paul. For one month, nobody noticed. And then we're like, hey, we're gonna take this feature out, because it doesn't work for the game, just because you expect it to be in here. And everyone was like, no, no, you can't do that. It adds so much strategic depth. And we're like, well, guess what? It's been out for a month already. You've just been blindly hammering the space bar to reload. There's no tactical element in that whatsoever. I love that story. So cover, another thing we kind of took out of here, you expect cover in a tactical shooter or in like in a, basically in this type of game when you look at it, um, slow the game down a lot. The difference here between this type of cover though, and this is the thing that's dangerous. When you just take things blindly from one game, into another game. Uh, there's another analogy I like to use, which is chocolate and pizza. So pizza is a pretty delicious food. I think people can agree with that. Chocolate is also good. They're both good things by themselves, but when you put them together, as is, it's really disgusting. All right, and this is the kind of the idea. You just can't take one thing and expect it to work somewhere else. And this thing what happened with a lot of these things, like cover. Um, and with here, it slowed the game pace down. People were like, oh yeah, but cover. And cover works in games like this. You're like, of course, they're shooting. But it basically made people stand in the same place. You couldn't outsmart them because the difference between this type of cover and like a shooter cover is you actually can't see everything at the same time. There's a lot of tactical depth because you're hiding behind their obscuring sight. You gotta basically figure out where stuff is coming from. Whereas here, you're like, well, I see everything going on in like a 360 degree radius around me. I'm not scared of anything. You lose a lot of that tactical depth right there. Turning radius. I mean, this is one of these things. For any of you guys, if you have animators working with you or people who are like really pushing for realistic animations, sometimes it doesn't work. You really want to make it snappy. Um, you want to make the game feel good. Just because in a kind of, kind of classic shooter, it's like, yes, you know, I have to turn like this. You have, you have to have the animation. Sometimes it doesn't feel the best. We actually did this. We actually we had this very slow turning radius. We took this out. We made it really snappy. We made it feel really good. Just this one little thing. We actually had a thing where uh, because in the game, we've been testing this uh, internally, and we didn't push it to live yet. Uh, our project manager actually panicked one day because he was playing the game on live, and he was like, why is the game so slow right now? And he was like, the game is broken, and he basically stopped everything and made us test it, and then we just found out that it was just because of the turning radius. These small things make a huge difference for the players. Just because they expect something doesn't mean they actually want it there. And that's a really, really big thing. Uh, again, there's a quote I like, which is for designers, if it's my, if it's major to the designer, it's minor It's minor to the player. If it's minor to the designer, like a thing like this, it's basically invisible to the player. They're not gonna be able to tell you on your forums, on your feedback that, hey, you know, I wish the turning radius was faster. They'll just be like, it feels shitty. And that's all you're gonna get, all right? So it's up to you guys to figure this kind of stuff out. So, 
complexity. We'll keep going here. So same deal here. We had height levels and I'll move a little bit faster. And we're like, oh yeah, we'll have height levels. And it's like, why? Because shooters have height levels. That was basically, there was like no other purpose other than that because shooters have height levels. And that basically caused a lot of problems for us from animation to tactic stuff. You couldn't, we, we couldn't have characters who actually went in. If you had a character that did close range, you can't get close to the guy because he's upstairs and you can't get upstairs unless you walk this entire path and he's just shooting you in the face the entire time. We switched this stuff with kind of more traditional stuff. This is basically smoke, brush, etc. It worked out a lot better. Loadout system, same deal here. We had a really, really complex system, which was a equipment system, how you get your gear, how you level up your characters. We're like, okay, we don't need this kind of stuff. You expect this in a shooter, but what we're really trying to say here is a MOBA. Change it much simpler. It's just very, very, very basic kind of MOBA stuff. Select your items, bring it in, use them. And we're, even, it, we're basically even going further on this and integrating more and more stuff in here. All right, so our game mode, coming to the end of this, we had a domination mode, you saw this in our video, which is great, most shooters have a domination mode. However, it didn't work for us at all. And one of the things here is, because of the MOBA stuff, you basically had, in a, in a shooter, domination mode works because you get something where it's like, one guy can kill three guys, easy. One grenade, pistol, doesn't matter what class you are, pistol, three headshots, if I'm good, I'm good. However, here we had class-based combat, so hey, it basically means like if you're a support character, you can't, there's no way you'll be able to kill anybody else, period. Did not work out at all. And this came from other games too. If you ever played uh, the Minion League of Legends, same thing happened here. Tanky Bruisers got really, really dominant because of what I exactly just explained. So that's where the level design came in. And this is where we finally went like, hey, what exactly is going on? We actually built a map here, a desert mining map um, for Merc Elite, and we basically patterned it with a lot of stuff you find in MOBAs. So we actually had global sight, a lot of areas. We had much stronger lanes. We had basically kind of like a bear and dragon mechanic in there. Um, and then we tried it out, and the feedback we got from the players was really, really positive. And this is when we went like, okay, this is what we're going on. This is the core. This is what our players are expecting, but they're not telling us. And that's the kind of thing. Sometimes, again, it's good to do these tests to kind of see what's going on because their, their players will basically tell you exactly what they're thinking, not through what they're actually saying, but basically through the playing rates, the retention rates, et cetera, et cetera. And this became our most, most played map, and that's, what, that's when we were like, okay, I think we've got it, we've nailed something down here. So I've explained a lot of stuff there, so wait, what exactly are we? We're like, okay, some people expect MOBA stuff, some people accept, uh, expect shooter stuff, so exactly what is going on? Are we a MOBA? Are we a top-down shooter? Did we just randomly throw stuff out for no reason? Because that's what it really seemed like. I'm not, sh I'm not sure. It's like, it's like looking in a mirror. So this is where we get to the myth of innovation. And this is what this talk is really about, which is expectations. How many of you guys have played Journey at all? Of those of you guys who played Journey, how many of you guys think this is a really innovative game? Raise your hand. A couple of you guys. All right. So the thing here is this is one of those universally acclaimed games. But when you think about it, you're like, well, what did they really do differently? Did they go crazy? Did they go the sushi route? And you're like, well, no, not really. If you look at it, it basically controls like an average third person, like a very average controlling third person kind of adventure game. They're not doing anything fancy there. What they really innovated on was the communication, how you communicate with other players and maybe the art style there, but that was pretty much it. They didn't go crazy with trying to do something different for every single thing. They picked one thing, they're like, this is gonna be our special thing. We'll focus on this. We don't want to stray too far off. And then you get this. No one ever talks about, hmm, this game plays a lot like other games, but the communication is really cool. No, they just say like, oh wow, the game itself is really cool because of the package. There's some stuff they understand in there already. You don't want to go too far away from that. You innovate like on this on a lot of different things for like mechanics. This is punch out. Regenerating health has been around for like, gosh, 20, 20 odd years now, but no one's like, hmm, we should innovate on this kind of stuff. It comes very naturally. I mean, if you go all the way to Halo, this is when it actually made a huge difference in modern games. This is the innovation this game really brought, which was that regenerating health mechanic, because now, instead of designing boss fights, we're like, you're like, okay, you fight a little bit, pick up some health, rest a bit, health. You have to pace stuff out there. You can make every fight very fast, very fierce, because hey, you know this resource is going to come back, and you can design very differently around there. This is when the shooters really, really started to become really different in the way the pacing goes and the way the level design went. Even went into the RPGs. If you guys played Final Fantasy 13, same deal. Every fight, it wasn't like, well, I'm gonna drink a potion after every fight. Uh, I use some spells. Okay, heal, heal, heal. Memory, memory management, like basically menu management. It was basically getting to the part where you're like, okay, every fight can be interesting because you can die every single fight. And just this one thing changed the entire way RPGs played, shooters played 
basically from this point forward. Same thing with genres, when we're mixing genres, which is what we're doing in Shards of War, we're really mixing top-down shooter stuff, MOBA stuff, we'll talk a little bit more about this. This is from uh, FIFA. When you take a look at this, there's a player card, you see the stats. Yep, pretty in-depth. But when you really look at it, you think about it like FIFA, it's like becoming like more and more like an RPG every day. Because this is the stuff you want to really focus on. It's like, don't look at the fact that, you know, like, okay, he's from Real Madrid, he's got passing, like his passing skill, his dribbling skill, et cetera, et cetera. You want to focus on what players are actually interested in. Sports players, that's why fantasy football and all these things are so big. They like stats. They like, basically, players. They like units. They like stats. This is what they're interested in. Because when you really boil it down, this and this are pretty much the same thing in terms of what players are actually interested in at the heart of it. And this is the type of stuff you want to go. Don't be like, oh, they don't like wizards. They like, no, these players like stats. They like units. So this is what we're going to focus on. And this is how you really dig really deep into there. So, and this is where it comes to innovation while preserving the core. This is the key thing. How do we do this? There's a game, Street Fighter Cross Tekken. Try to be innovative. They're like, tag team system, cool, cool, cool. Where did their innovation come from? Their innovation came from, hey, we're going to have a gem system in there, which is, hey, you can equip these things, and they activate, and they give you extra strength, et cetera, et cetera. However, you could buy these, all right? Basically, and that broke the core of fighting games. For fighting games, it's basically very fair, basically, PvP action. That is the core of the fighting game. That is the heart of it. And as soon as you break this, everybody left. This game didn't last more than six months in the competitive scene. It was basically just out. On the other end, there's some newer games out there. If you guys have seen Rising Thunder, give it a shot. It's very interesting. Um, they're doing the same thing. They're also doing, hey, equip, et cetera, et cetera. But what they're really, really focusing on here is ease of use of your skills. So instead of saying, hey, the core PvP is still there. It's really, really, it's really, really tight. It's really, really interesting. But instead, they're like, OK, we want to make sure this is accessible. So their innovation comes into to use a skill, to use a, you don't to do a fireball or something, you don't have to be like down, down, forward, forward, whatever button, now you just hit a button. You're like, okay, this one button will fire this fireball, this button will do a punch, dragon punch, et cetera, et cetera. So now the innovation comes in that people can skip past all the, like, the finger mechanics, like all the, like, the really fast finger mechanics, and go straight into the meta game, go straight into the mind games. This is the type of innovation you want to be looking at, because the core of fighting games is the heavy duty PvP, fair PvP. It's about players fighting players. That's what it goes down to. Even stuff like Destiny. Now, this is the thing where, like, as you know, this game came out. There's a lot of controversy around this where it's like, what the heck is this? Half the people were like, this game is terrible. And half the people were like, wow, this game is amazing. And this is actually two things here. They preserved the core, but they did not preserve expectations. But as you can see, by preserving the core, you're actually you're going to get people in there. The uh, expectations is more of a marketing problem at this point, because Destiny is still alive, you st it's still going, you st a lot of daily players, I think the average playtime is three hours per day is what the latest stats three announced, but when you play the game, half the people were like, well, okay, Bungie made this game, Bungie, Halo, all right, it's gonna be a great shooter game, and that's what they got, they got a great shooter game with some RPG stuff on the side, and those are the people that were happy, because this is what they expected. Now the other people who didn't really know, maybe didn't know about Bungie as much before, didn't play much Halo, they're like, oh, look at this awesome sci-fi space MMORPG. Well, guess what? You didn't really get that at all. You got a really cool shooter, you didn't really get an MMORPG. The core was still there to keep people coming back, and they're slowly working on the marketing to fix this. But in the beginning, the expectations were way off for this group of people. And this is another game uh, I've been playing a lot lately. This is Final Fantasy Record Keeper. Any of you guys know this at all? No, nobody. All right, so this is a mobile game. It's uh, all you really do in this game is uh, collect characters, grind, make weapons, get more weapons, grind, collect more characters, level up. Sounds pretty boring, actually, until you think about what an RPG you actually do in Final Fantasy, and you're like, okay, yeah, that's about right. And that's basically what it comes down to. They basically nailed what people really enjoy about Final Fantasy, the characters, the grinding, the leveling, et cetera, et cetera. And that's why it works. So this is my message for you guys, is to find your core. This is not as easy as it is all the time, and I'll talk about how we found ours. So, what is your core? All right, you found it, okay. Keep it, don't touch it, make it very, very clear. Now, figure out what part you're trying to innovate on. Don't try to innovate everything. As you can see from that giant list we had before, it's just way too much stuff to figure out. Pick one thing you think is really gonna push the game forward. Like in, think Journey. They didn't try to really go crazy with Journey on a whole bunch of stuff like, they're like, oh, okay, we're gonna have the character control like this when you're flying, you're gonna use the six axis like this. You're like, no. Communication, one button, one button for communication. When you think about it, the, all of the, uh, what do you call it, the innovation in that game really comes down to one button, which is like, okay, this is how I talk to other people, and that's it. 
you have to communicate just with these symbols, and that's cool. Sell this message to your audience, all right? They're like, hey guys, this is the burger. We're gonna give you this burger. What's cool about this burger? It's got bacon on it. You guys love bacon, all right? That's the kind of thing. You wanna innovate on that kind of stuff. Okay? Okay, let's keep moving. So, the other side of this, and you wanna be careful about this, is too much of a good thing. I was saying like, oh yeah, just do all this cool stuff, you know, like do all, everything you want, but you don't wanna go overboard with this either. Going back to the burger example. This burger is called the douche burger. It's a real thing. It's $666. Um, it is like Kobe beef, and uh, I believe it's like lobster tail, caviar, aged Gruyere cheese. I think they steam the cheese with champagne. Um, there's gold foil on there. Uh, oh God, there's a, lot, there's a lot of stuff on there. So, oh yeah, Kopi Luwak barbecue sauce. So, all of these are, really, like I said about that pizza chocolate thing, all of these are really good ingredients by themselves. They are excellent. But if you put too much good stuff together at the same time, you get this. So, again, all the cool stuff, multiple platforms. By, the, by themselves, in the right circumstance, all of these are good. Multiple, multiple platforms, cover mechanics, height levels, ammo reload, item system, big item system, realistic turning, detailed shooter maps. Again, when you put this all together, you get the mess. All right? You have to be very careful about what you pick up. Again, game design is a lot like cooking. Once you find the base ingredient, then you can build around it. So, go a little bit into detail about how we did this in our map design. This is a map design for Mercury. Uh, you can kind of see there, it's uh, pretty cool looking. It's a kind of harbor and a ship. We have very deep and complex maps. Again, we try to build for top-down battlefield. We pitched to players as a MOBA, and that was the problem. We basically told them it was, it was the wrong genre in this case. So, you take a look at this. This is one of the maps in uh, Mercury. Looks pretty cool. It's pretty complex. It looks like a shooter map. Looks a lot like this, which is a map from Call of Duty. Just the way things are laid out, cover exactly paths, et cetera, et cetera. Very, very close. Another one from Halo. This is from Dota. This is a MOBA. As you can see, it's very, very different in how these two maps go about. And this is where we messed up on, is we were telling people like, hey, you're gonna play a MOBA. However, the map wasn't even close to that. Even with newer MOBAs, like here's the storm, you can kind of see the same deal here. You get three lanes, you have a jungle, very clear paths, towers, et cetera, et cetera. We didn't mess up on the map, we messed up on the genre. We basically told players it was a different genre than actually it was. And this is the thing, it's like you bit into that sandwich and you didn't get beef, you got fish. This is where they're very surprised, but we told you it was beef. So, what's the core of the MOBA? It's a single map mode, it's been around for ages, since Aeon of Strife. So, Again, when people hear the word MOBA these days, yeah, a lot of people like Gigantic and games like this, they throw out the word MOBA like it's like, oh yeah, it's a MOBA. And then when people play it, and you saw this at Gamescom this year, a lot of the, the fan reactions were like, yeah, you said it was a MOBA, but it, was, it really wasn't. It was, like, it was just, just kind of some kind of action, you know, like PvP action game. Because when people say MOBA, they're thinking Dota, they're thinking League of Legends, that really core three lanes kind of stuff. So, what did we miss there? We didn't have progression, we didn't have clear structure. Strategic goals, towers, nexus, dragon, uh, jungle minions didn't have tactical safety. It's like, which way do I run if I'm in trouble? In a mobile, you always know. You run back towards your base. That's the safest thing. Always this direction is dangerous. Always this direction, for the most part, is safe. In a shooter, you're like, I, I don't know which direction is safe. You can get shot from basically every single angle. There's constant engagement. Always something to do. There's PvE and PvP there. It's class-based combat. That's another thing. It's like, hey, if you're a supporter, you're a support. If you're a tank, you're a tank. In a shooter, if you play Call of Duty, they have the different classes. They're like medic, they have like close combat. The difference between like medic and close combat is medic has like maybe a UAV or like some kind of like heal setup, or a close combat guy's just like, he has a different gun, he has a shotgun. And that's the kind of deal. But if you're good, your medic can kill like 10 people by himself too. And that's the big difference. In this type of game, because they're clearly defined roles, you don't expect a support to be able to kill a tank but you have to make that very clear. It's not a bad thing, you just have to make it clear to the players that that's what they're getting. And a lot, we had a lot of players very frustrated with that because they're like, how come I can't kill anybody? We're like, well, you're playing a support. You're like, he's got a gun. You're like, oh, okay. So again, when you take a look at a map, again, from Call of Duty, same kind of deal, you get very, very few of this kind of thing. You're like, well, where do I go to be safe? You know, like, because there's multiple spawn spots, you're like, which capture point should I go towards? Uh, what's the tactical safety? What's the strategic goals here except capturing stuff and just lying in wait and shooting people? There's not constant engagement, et cetera, et cetera. Again, this translates directly to Merc Elite. Well, we changed this up again for Shards of War with our map design. As you can kind of see here, you see the, we went kind of more classic route, three lanes, and then we had a different jungle, 
we have another, another map of the Meridian Gate. Again, three lanes. Jungle looks very different. Very different goals in here, but the general idea is the same towers, lanes, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm running out of time, so I'm going to move a little bit faster. Tier system. There's another thing we did. World of Tanks, if you guys have played this, I'll just explain this to you. What a tier system is, very, very briefly, is that if you are tier three tank, you're always going to be stronger than a tier one tank. Period. That's how it works. Higher numbers is always stronger. That's the way this system works. Now we use this too for Merc Elite. So how did this work or how not work? First off, 5v5, 15 versus 15 right off there. Just the median kind of number of players is much lower. Uh, sorry, much higher on World of Tanks. Just means it evens out a lot better. Respawn versus permanent damage. If I'm a tier one tank, I'm attacking a tier three tank and I do like 90% damage, and I die, that damage doesn't go away, it stays. For me as a player, I can be like, wow, I am really good because I did this, I was able to do this to you, and I feel like a valued team member. For your team members, they're like, wow, I can't believe that tier one tank guy did that much damage to a tier three tank, that is amazing. Like, that guy's a good player. Because that's it, the damage doesn't go away. With our game, tier one guy runs with tier three guy, you take up 90%, you die, you're like, okay, I'm a really good player. When you come back and you respawn, he's basically back to full health, you're like, I've done nothing, you've erased Everything you've done, it just doesn't feel good. Just this one simple thing here. Static focus, focus shifting utilities. So again, with, with Merc Elite, if you're a specific class, you're always gonna be that class. You can't change. If you're, again, in World of Tanks, if you have a lower tier tank, people will be like, okay, stay out of the fight. You got, you be the scout, find us the right angles, sneak up on them, et cetera, et cetera. You can actually change your role in basically the match. With us, we couldn't. It's like, if you're a tank, you're a tank. But if you're like a tier one tank fighting tier three guys, you're a really shitty tank and that feels really bad. And again, this is something for you guys, especially marketing. I know there's marketing guys in here. You gotta be careful about this, which is, hey, just because something works doesn't mean it's good. All right, this is very important. With World of Tanks, people are like, oh, look at all these cool things in there. Same thing with like League of Legends. People are like, wow, look at this cool UI. Like, no, it's not, all right? The reason a lot of this stuff works is because it's the first of its kind, or the only of its kind, it's the front runner. If you are the front runner, you can get away with so much stuff. All right, you can have terrible UI, you can have terrible flow, but people want that experience. All right, you shouldn't copy that. If you are coming into the game late, you're a second, third, fourth, fifth, whatever mover, you're facing heavy competition, don't just copy stuff. Think about why that works. Just because it worked previously doesn't mean it's actually good. It could have just been, it was there before. Character design, we'll run through this a little bit quickly. So in Merc Elite, we had pretty, like with the tier design, the tier system, you actually just have to keep the same unit and keep moving up, but they have to you just add an extra skill or not. This is actually five different characters here, so that's not very exciting. You get like an extra bag, another shoulder pad, et cetera, et cetera. Here's four more characters, three more characters. It's, it's not exciting to collect these guys. This is basically, you're looking at 12 different characters right now, but even though they get stronger, it's not exciting to get these guys. With artworks, you can't do too much. You're like, okay, give them a bigger gun, give them a helmet. All right, it's not exciting to look at this kind of stuff. Well, Shards of War we went away from that. We went to individual characters, something that you expect from MOBA and not from a kind of a shooter game. So because of this, we were able to get a lot of very different and kind of unique looking characters out of here. Let's run through these real quick. And the same thing with the artworks. You get a lot of really interesting looking characters here compared to what you saw before. So thank you for some of these artworks, Paul. So again, this is where we come from where it's like, hey, it just gives us the freedom to do everything here. And again, small changes make a really big impact in these cases. Like I said, in Journey, that's that one thing. Taking away the communication, putting it all on a button, huge impact. That was the entire point of the creativity of that game. Same thing, if you guys play shooters at all, Halo, Call of Duty, to a guy who doesn't play, Shooter games, you're like, oh yeah, uh, one's in space, other one's on Earth. Okay, that's the difference. That's about it. For those of you guys who play these games, you know they play very, very differently because of just one thing, engagement time. It's like the time to fight in Halo is very, very different from the time to fight in a Call of Duty. And because of this, tactics are different, how you approach things are different, movement, et cetera, et cetera, becomes very, very different. One small thing can make a huge difference in a game. For us, what was this? What do we use to really push our game and differentiate ourselves? This is our controls. Again, when we brought it up, we're like, hey, it looks like a top-down shooter. It looks like a twin-stick shooter. So, okay, let's make it a twin-stick shooter. Is there a MOBA out there that's a twin-stick shooter? No. Let's position it like that. We want to keep it as a MOBA because that's what we told players we're going to be. However, we want to push the combat. We want to push the controls. And this is the one thing we chose to really push. You saw the maps, pretty standard. Even the item system, all this kind of stuff, didn't go too far away. It was very recognizable. But because of this, we really want to push the controls. 
And that changes the way you tank because of the movement and changes the way basically you attack all the time with the run and gun tactics. It changes combat. It changes combat completely. And for you guys who know, this might seem like just one word, but if you play a mobile, any kind of PvP game, it's about combat. If you change the one thing that people are gonna be doing 90% of the time. You don't, you don't come to play a mobile to be like, hey, let's be friends and like hang out and you know, try out you know, like different outfits. No, you come here to shoot other people. This is the type of game you wanna play and you wanna focus on this kind of thing. We kept, the, we kept the form factor the same. People saw the maps, they're like, okay, I get it. They saw the characters, how the items work, they're like, I get it. What's different about it? What is that special ingredient? It's just the controls, because it changes so much about the combat. So, this is what the game looks like now. And it's a little older trailer, but you get an idea. So, for a lot of you MOBA guys, that's the point is, for you guys who played MOBAs or are interested in this kind of thing, you look at it, you're like, oh man, top-down shooter. We tell you this right off the bat. You're like, oh, I see drones, I see minions, I see towers. You're like, but what's going on? What's with all the shooting? Exactly, like, it's much faster, much faster pace. And that's what you want to do. It's like, you look at it and you're like, I understand. I understand what this game is. I know exactly what to expect, but there's a twist. And we tell you what the twist is, and that's what gets you excited. So. We're not done yet here. I'm gonna share with you a little bit about what we're kind of pushing and how we're thinking about what we're uh, pushing features on. So again, what our core USP is, is WASD shooter combat. It's top-down shooter. Our special ingredient is the combat, is the movement. All right, don't stray too far away from everything else but this. So again, with your features, keep this in mind. Everything has to loop back to whatever your core USP is. Doesn't matter what type of game, figure out your USP, loop back to it, keep the rest of the game the same. Be innovative where you can, but be innovative where it makes sense. We add some stuff that you might see in shooters, execute. Now, I won't go talk too much about this, but yeah, it's kind of more sustained mechanics, something you would expect from a shooter. But again, you can't just take stuff from one game and to pull it into another game. You have to make it work very specifically. In our case, it's not just like kind of a taunt thing. We actually use it as a lane sustained mechanic, kind of like a health pack, et cetera, et cetera. We have a skilled PvP mechanic. So this is the kind of thing where, and this is very important for you guys, no matter what type of game you're making, but especially on PvP games, what players need to see is a way that it's very, very, very clear for a high-level player that they're very good, and a low-level player understands why they're good, but then they need to know they have to practice to get there. So for fighting games, it's combos. You see some guy do like a 90-hit combo. You're like, he's a good player. I got it. I know what to do. The hard part is doing it. Platformers, it's the same kind of deal. With MOBAs, you're like CS, creep score, killing like minions. You're like, wow, he's very good at doing that. Skill shots. This is what we're adding in there, which is kind of like denying EXP drops. That's what we're trying out right now. Kill streaks. we're adding stuff like killstreaks, something you might expect from a actual shooter, but we're doing this a little bit differently. Um, we have a level system very close, something like Heroes of the Storm, team-based level, but we really wanna push it more in a shooter direction, kind of a melding of both, because hey, a lot of guys expect killstreaks, but you just can't bring killstreaks in there and be like, okay, now there's dogs, now there's a nuke, now there's a chopper, but we have to do this in a very clever way, so this is what we're looking at. Destructible environments, that's another thing we're looking at right now, which is, hey, in a shooter, you can like, boom, blow up, blow up stuff, blow up big pieces of walls, create new paths, stuff in the battlefield, you see this a lot. In MOBAs, one of the problems we see is symmetrical maps, or only asymmetrical maps, or only symmetrical maps. So what we're trying to solve this is basically making the maps symmetrical in the beginning, but have the ability to basically make them asymmetrical. And this is very interesting for us to kind of push this direction. Uh, we have graffiti taunts, this kind of a stamp system you know in uh, shooters like Counter-Strike whatnot, that you can tag stuff on the wall. And this is something where, this is not an actual mechanic that affects the gameplay, but this is something that affects the feeling of the game. We've been polling a lot of our players about this. They're like, oh yeah, this is a mechanic I'll expect from a shooter. Now it doesn't affect, again, just by showing them this, they're like, oh wow, that feels like a shooter. It doesn't actually change any kind of gameplay, but it's something you expect from these type of games. And just by adding it in there, in this kind of version, on the ground instead of on the wall, people are like, oh yeah, 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 Counter-Strike has it, of course, yeah. Shards of War is a top-down shooter, of course they'll have something like this. And it's, again, it's just perception. It's just expectations on the player. So yeah, that is a lot of stuff. 
a lot of stuff over there. But again, it has to loop back to our core USP, which is the WSD shooter combat. So wrapping up here, well, I've talked about a lot of complex things, but you don't want to do complexity for the sake of being complex. That's the biggest problem. Have you guys have seen this game before? Is it XCOM? Yes. So there's the XCOM shooter. Now the deal here is like, okay, XCOM, X known as a tactical game, you're controlling your units, now you're playing a shooter, so they're like, okay, it's XCOM. It has to be a complex tactical game, so we basically have to basically control your units. Basically every five seconds, you have to give your units a new order. Now this is bad, because basically you've broken USP on the shooter side. You've kept your USP on the XCOM side, but you're building a shooter. You're not building a tactical game. This basically interrupts the uh, fighting flow every five, six seconds, because you have to give a guy a new order. But at the same time, you have to actually aim and shoot and not just be tactical about it. It doesn't quite work in there. This is one of my favorite games of all time, Smash Brothers, if any of you guys have played this. Now this game, again, when I just talk about complexity for the sake of it, it's not. It's probably the most complex fighting game out there, but the complexity doesn't lie in the controls. To do a special move, to do a super in this game, you just hold down the B button. To do a super in a traditional fighting game like Capcom vs. SNK2, this is the actual button combination to do a super move in a Capcom vs. SNK2, so it's like light kick. If you do this fast, light kick, light punch, light punch, light kick, light kick, heavy kick, heavy kick, a heavy punch, heavy punch, heavy kick, heavy kick, down back, heavy, heavy punch. And if you do that all right, you'll get the move. But you gotta do that pretty fast. Again, that versus holding B. The difference here is, what do, they, what do they make complex? They made the actual PvP, the player's engagement against each other, very complex. But to play the game, it's not. You can just go in with like your little cousin and be like, oh yeah, you can have fun there. But you can also play at high levels. This is the difference. This is what you should really focus on. Where should the complexity in your game lie and where does it actually make sense there? Again, the ammo and reload stuff for us, same deal, it doesn't have to be complex. Where should it be complex? And for us, it was in the actual dodging and all these mechanics I talked to you about. But again, build for your audience. This is very important. Dark Souls, I don't think everyone has, anyone has said Dark Souls is a really, really terrible game. But the deal here, it's really freaking hard. It's so hard the tutorial kills you, all right? But that's the deal here. It's like, this is what the players expect. They don't, they, you don't, they don't say like, Dark Souls is a casual game that is good for all ages. Please come and enjoy it stress-free. That is not the marketing campaign. The marketing campaign was basically like, you're gonna die, you know? Pretty much that was what it is. And people were like, okay. And the people who, are like, who expected this, they came and they played. And that's why the game honestly did so well, because it grabbed the right type of people to play the game. It's not bad that it's so freaking hard, but they sold it right and they made it for the right group. Same deal, uh, Gran Turismo. You can like, change the tire pressure in your back. You're like, okay, I can change the tire pressure in my back left tire. What does this actually do? I have no idea, all right? When I play racing games, it's like, do I take the cloud body or do I take you know, like the rainbow wheels, all right? That's how I play racing games. But again, it's not bad that this is complex because they built it for the right audience and they sold it to the right audience. They didn't say that this is, they're like Gran Turismo, real sports racing simulation. And that's how they sold it, all right? They're not like Mario Kart, real sports racing simulation. It doesn't, doesn't work like that. And the same deal. Dynasty Warriors, if any of you guys have played this, I don't think anyone has been like, man, Dynasty Warriors, I wish this game was less Chinese, all right? Because that's not the target audience. You focus on your audience, you see what they like, you really push that, and you innovate for your audience, you innovate very clearly, but build smart. This is one of my favorite quotes, which is, if I had asked my customers what they'd wanted, they would have said a faster horse, all right? This is from Henry Ford, who invented the electric horse, that's correct, the car. So, but the thing here, what this quote is really cool about is, like we said, about the combat in Shards of War and basically like communication and journey is, it's not about going, oh, we should do something totally crazy, like, what does a horse do as a mean of transportation? All right, got it. What do people want? They, want? they don't want a better horse, they want a better means of transportation. And this is where this came out of, and this is what you really want to focus on over here. So take some time, think one step above what is on the face value there. So remember, what's the word for today? Anybody? Expectations. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Really? Sesame Street? Do you guys have, you guys have Sesame Street here? Yes? Okay. All right. Sorry. I wasn't quite sure. <laughs> Expectations. It's so important. When you bite into that burger, make sure it's beef. Don't make sure, it, make sure it's not anything else. So thank you very much for your time. I'm Al Yang. I'm the lead designer here on Shards of War. Over at Big Point, uh, I'll be taking some questions. Now you can find me at this email address or on Twitter. Uh, this is the part where I talk about we're hiring, so if you guys are interested in joining the team and taking a look, we're looking for a wide variety of guys right now, UX designers, concept artists, uh, illustrators, programmers, and much, much more. But wait, just come and talk to me afterwards. So thank you again, and uh, that's it. Perfect.
thank you so much. Eh? Um, so do we have some questions? Yeah, hi, thanks for your talk. Um, uh, based on uh, what uh, you just told us, uh, you had a pretty good top-down twin-stick shooter and you sold it as a top-down twin-stick shooter, so 80% shooter, 20% mobile. Why do you fix the 80% and not just fix the 20% and... So that's the deal here is we... This is one of the things you want, you want to look at the market at the same time. We're like, okay, MOBAs, twin-stick shooters. And it just happened to be the kind of the perfect time where if you look on Steam, you look at any games out there, there's no team-based top-down shooters really out there right now. And we're like, okay, what is the most hardcore team-based thing? We're already selling this as a MOBA. We're going to rebrand it. MOBA, very, very hardcore team-based game. And this is where we want to innovate. We're like, okay, we know that. We want a team-based game. We want to focus on this team-based PvP. And that's where the innovation came out. It was like, now we shift the combat into the MOBA. If you notice, the game is still being sold as a futuristic sci-fi, like top-down shooter MOBA. So again, for what we are talking about earlier, the MOBA is the game mode. That stays the same. That's easily recognizable. Everybody knows what that is. What you want to innovate on is what do you do within that play space, and that's where the top-down shooter part comes in. We want what you have to do very recognizable. It's just how you do it to be unique and new. Hello, hello. Um, on mobile type uh, games, uh, what's leading their design right now is like eSports. Are you guys thinking about that? In, it has changed the way are you, got, you guys are designing the game in some way? Absolutely. So the question was, why do I have such a cool haircut? And uh, I'm, I'm not sh able to explain this to you, I just do. But the other question was eSports. All right, what are we doing about eSports? Now, if you take a look at our game right now, this is something, again, because it's competitive. We are marketing as eSports. Um, we're actually going to be giving a talk uh, pretty soon. I, I can link you to it, but we had, we're in cooperation with the ESL right now, and we basically did a series of tournaments, uh, Go For Cup, Battle of the Shards, et cetera, et cetera, leading up to Gamescom. If you've been to Gamescom, we built a giant booth, and the point of the booth was not to get players to actually play the game. It was to show off eSports, or to show off the competitive nature of the game. And this is, some, this is something for all you guys, especially if you're building competitive games. The earlier you get eSports level people in there, the sooner they're gonna find stuff that breaks your game, that validates it, because if these guys at the high level cannot play the game, and they can't, you can't watch a high level game and be like, that is a really interesting game. There's something up. These are the guys you want to engage with the most right away. So this is what we did from the very beginning, small tournaments, online tournaments, all the way leading up to a big in-person tournament at Gamescom. And we'll be doing this again at uh, DreamHack Leipzig this year. And we're already starting the online tournaments leading up to that to get the pools of the people. OK, any more questions? Great, so thank you so much Al, for the talk. Um, please fill out um, the form and thank you. Thanks, guys.